hello everybody. Thank you for joining us this evening. This panel was organized by Habitat Pro Association, a Quechua founded non-governmental organization with consultative status at the United Nations Economic and Social Council. Habitat Pro was founded in 2002 to promote the priorities and perspectives of indigenous peoples throughout all United Nations fora. Um, <clears throat> I would like to begin with a land acknowledgement. I am speaking from the city of Philadelphia in the United States. Philadelphia is located in the ancestral territory of the Lenape people who were forcibly removed from their lands, as is the location of the UN headquarters in New York. As some of you might know, the word Manhattan is derived from the Lenape word Manahata, meaning island of many hills. Land acknowledgements have become very popular, almost a prerequisite, and, th and thus have come to feel like an empty ritual, especially when given by powerful institutions who are in a position to actually engage in the material process of giving land back <clears throat> and making way for greater autonomy for indigenous communities. So from my personal perspective, I do land acknowledgements in hopes that it will position our thinking in a way that primes it to hold the complexity of the history that, had, that has led us to this moment in which we meet. The place you find yourself in at this moment has a history and the ways in which we engage with the complexity of said histories plays a critical role in how we shape our collective futures. I think uh, I like to think of land acknowledgements as an opportunity to engage the notions of what is possible and to grapple with the, the reality that poverty, war, gender-based violence, racial-based violence, unequal development, lack of access to healthcare, lack of access to education, and all forms of oppression are products of human will and not the fault of immutable natural laws nor mysterious spiritual phenomena. All of this is to say that we build the world that we live in. And perhaps a land acknowledgement is a moment that can offer us a kind of reflection that leads us into action, as opposed to superficially soothing, misplaced, paralyzing guilt that amounts to business as usual for everyone involved. Um, <clears throat> so our panel today is titled Unmapping the Earth. Uh, international solidarity against all borders. The tradition of internationalism and the practice of international solidarity is a proud one that has been around for ages and has manifested in many different modalities throughout history. In our indigenous language from back home in Paraguay, our word for solidarity or love for the other is Mboraihu. And Boraihu is the second thing that the creator created in the darkness before the earth. First was our sacred language, Avanye'e, and second was the ability to love another. Language and love then being foundational since they came into being before people did. There have been countless examples throughout history of international solidarity, like the international volunteers during the Spanish Civil War, more recently, the international volunteers that have joined the ranks of the Kurdish resistance movement, the anti-globalization movement, anti-imperialist movements, and groups that have mobilized to join indigenous struggles against the ongoing processes of colonization. Wherever there has been struggle or tragedy, there have been foreign volunteers who have tracked great distances, often facing, the, often facing grave risks of personal danger, to support a cause that they believe in. We are currently seeing with the Russian invasion of the sovereign nation of Ukraine, a large mobilization, not just of state actors or NGOs, but of everyday people coming together to engage with the war on the ground as volunteer combatants who have taken up arms and as providers of all different kinds of aid from food, housing, funds, and a myriad of gestures of human kindness to meet the needs of, of the ongoing refugee crisis. International solidarity also includes people who remain in place in their own homes and develop conscious building campaigns, host talks, participate in marches, and so on. We are familiar with internationalism, 
and many of us can understand the call to offer our support to struggles that are not our own or that seem that they are not our own. Both of our panelists do international solidarity work, but from different points of engagement. Lisa Shishko is an independent journalist and war correspondent who is currently working in northeastern Syria in a Kurdish autonomous region called Rojava. She is originally from Ukraine and she lived in Russia for many years. Lisa has been working in journalism since she was a teenager and predominantly did work for independent media in Russia and Ukraine. For the last few years, she has been working in the Caucasus and in the countries in the geopolitical region referred to as the Middle East. She has been working as a journalist in Rojava for four years as a war correspondent for local media, along with doing research and civic activism. Lisa has a blog called Women Life Freedom, where she presents her work as a freelance journalist. Lisa, thank you so much for joining us today. The floor belongs to you. Thank you for inviting me. So I'm speaking to you from the region of Northern Eastern Syria, or as it's called in Kurdish Rojava. And here in March uh, 2019, the terrorist organization ISIS was stopped by the Syrian Democratic Forces, the armed structures of the region, in cooperation with the global coalition. The region became famous for the Kurdish revolution, the victory over ISIS and the liberation of women. Women took an active part in the war against ISIS and against Turkish aggression. In addition, this region is known for attempting to create a new social system called democratic confederalism. This system involves the construction of a libertarian society, the liberation of women and the protection of the environment. Uh, many people in the world see Rojava as the only hope that the age of revolutions is not over and that even in the Middle East, which has become an arena for geopolitical games, it's possible to create a libertarian society with the liberation of women and all oppressed peoples. Looking ahead, I will say that the image of Rojava created in the media differs from reality. Even in the four years that I have been working in Rojava, the region has changed and of course, Rojava has changed a lot since the revolution started, since the July 19th of 2012. Uh, there is progress in some areas, uh, there is regression and there is stagnation. And for example, with the creation of autonomous administration in the region, they are successfully fighting colonialism and forced assimilation. For example, the Kurdish language is now used everywhere. Kurdish history is being studied, Kurdish culture is being revived. And moreover, in the region, there are examples of the same struggle against the assimilation of Armenians living in Syria. Thanks to the effort of autonomous administration and uh, the Syrian Democratic Forces, and Armenian battalion has been established in the region where assimilated Armenians are taught the Armenian language and the history of their ancestors. And of course, there is a huge progress in this because before the revolution, it was impossible to uh, give uh, children Kurdish names in Syria. So what problems does Rojava face? and who is responsible for these problems. Apart from successes, uh, that are many, there are many problems that the revolution in Rojava cannot cope with. Moreover, uh, new problems are emerging and previously unresolved problems turned into catastrophes that terrify the whole world, as was the case with the recent ISIS jailbreak Many foreigners visiting Rojava can only recognize a small fraction of all the problems that the population of the region faces. 
But having been here, it becomes clear for me that most of the problems that the region faces are due to the geopolitical interest of some other countries. It's difficult to build a libertarian society if um, the region is constantly under shelling and bombardment from the Turkish army. Uh, let's be clear, the Turkish army, a member of NATO, is attacking the region, occupying territories and arresting and killing indigenous people of these territories. Turkey blocks the water of the Euphrates River entering Syria. Because of this, in the region of northern east Syria, there is no water in summer, no electricity, and various epidemics appear due to the lack of drinking water. In addition, all humanitarian aid goes to the regions controlled by Damascus. But then, Damascus doesn't transfer this humanitarian aid to the regions of northern east Syria. Uh, the Telkacher border crossing checkpoint, which uh, would allow the delivery of humanitarian aid to the region of northern east Syria, is closed. And why is the world not interested in whether humanitarian aid reaches those who need it? Many camps for refugees and internally displaced persons are not officially recognized by the UN as refugee camps. Because of this, a huge number of people forced to flee due to the Turkish occupation of Syrian territories are left without any help. A huge number of internally displaced people have been living in tents since 2018. And let me remind you that in winter, the temperature here reaches minus 10 degrees Celsius. And the UN doesn't recognize these, um, these camps as uh, refugee camps or any camps. And why? This question should be put to, to the UN and it is only in our power to raise these issues again and again uh, until this injustice will be resolved. Um, camps such as camp, where refugees from Sedikania live, and Rosh camp, where mostly ISIS family live, are not recognized as camps. Camps set up by the autonomous administration are simply not officially considered as camps by the United, uh, United Nations. Please note that uh, the autonomous administration and the Syrian Democratic Forces, which in cooperation with the Global Coalition, protected the whole world from the spread of ISIS. So they don't, they don't have any official status and refugees in the territories control, controlled by the autonomous administration are not considered as refugees. Is it the, the fault of inhabitants of the region themselves? The Rosh camp is the home to families of ISIS fighters, but this camp is not recognized by the UN, which means that there are not so many resources, not so many working NGOs, as for example, in the Al-Hol camp, which is recognized by the UN. There are thousands of children uh, with foreign citizenship in the Al-Hol camp. They grow up in a camp with ISIS supporters. And I doubt that in such an environment, these children will grow up uh, to be adults who will be against ISIS. The region is a home to a huge number of ISIS foreigner nationals that foreign states don't seem to be planning to take home. Uh, NGOs working in the region through the UN are rebuilding schools, for example, in small villages in Derizor, uh, with population of a few thousand people. But in cities with hundreds of thousands of people, NGOs cannot rebuild schools. Why? All for the same reason, because NGOs have to work with the official government. And this is an amazing contradiction because the official government is accused in torture of prison, of torture in prison, the use of chemical weapons, the reprisals against its own citizens. But foreigner, uh, foreign NGOs are required to work with this government anyway. And this is contradiction. 
this contradiction of world social policy doesn't help the region and its inhabitants in any way. In addition, there is still possibility of a resurgence of ISIS in the region. And believe me, it's not the Syrian regime that are holding the ISIS resurgence, but the autonomous administration and its armed structures. After all, the entire concern for the fight against the sleeping cells of ISIS, as well as those arrested ISIS, including foreign citizens from ISIS, lies with the autonomous administration of the Northern Syria. I remind you that in the territories of northern East Syria, there are thousands of foreigner citizens from ISIS and their families with children growing up in jihadist ideology. Tell me, should foreign countries finally take their ISIS citizens from here, or will the world continue to silently watch this time bomb? All of these listed problems can be solved outside of the region. I emphasize once again that these problems were not created by the inhabitants of the region. Accordingly, their responsibility for solving these problems cannot lie only with the inhabitants of the region. And it's in our power to influence the solution of these problems. The whole world depends on what happens in this region. I remind you that there is a NATO military contingent in the region, Turkey and its proxies, ISIS, the military contingent of Russia, Iran, even Hezbollah, uh, the army of Syrian regime, as well as the global coalition with the military from the United States and many other countries. Just imagine how interested other countries are in this small piece of land. Here is literally everyone. Any catastrophe that has occurred in this region can develop into a global crisis that's why it's necessary to always remember this region, quickly solve the problems that arise here and not ignore them. The media will remember this region only when something like an ISIS jailbreak happens here again and ISIS begins to threaten the world again, but it may be too late. And during the four years that I spent here, I saw many foreigners who came here to help the people of the region. But this help very often turned out to be superficial and didn't bring real help to the res residents. Why it happens? Uh, and why do numerous internationalists, journalists who come here draw the image of Rojava different from reality? Who benefits? In my opinion, there are numbers of reasons. The first reason is the fact that internationalists come to special camps for internationalists or live under the supervision of revolutionaries, representative of the autonomous administration who care about the safety of internationalists. Because here really is a war in the region. Turkish proxies constantly shell the front lines and even attack civilians' vehicles by drones. It's almost impossible for foreigners to integrate into society and understand the needs and problems of locals. In addition, there is a um, cultural difference in Orientalist view of the Middle East, and many foreigners regard the Middle Easterners as unequal. Um, many journalists come here for a couple of months, they sit in the hotel, they drive everywhere by car, and they write articles after about the war. Uh, at the same time, in fact, uh, in the region, electricity comes to people's homes for a couple of hours a day at best. And sometimes there is no water at all, no fuel, no heat and in winter. Therefore, the image of Rajava is very different from reality due to the unwillingness of the world to consciously approach the real solution of problems. The second and uh, most important reason why there is no real effect from the internationalism um, is the fact that there is not enough media coverage of the region, the region's problem. People simply do not know about what is happening in the region. Of course, this depends on the policy of our states, the authorities of our states, because the media is also a tool for changing and controlling the opinions of society. And accordingly, almost all media outlets follow instructions from above 
including many opposition media outlets, because they also sponsor someone. My colleagues and I have repeatedly encountered the fact that uh, very progressive media refused to publish works about Rojava because they didn't fit into their already created image of Rojava, pointed out the problems that the people of Rojava face. Some media do not want to destroy the image of Rojava revolution. The first step towards solving problems in the region and reducing the risk of humanitarian catastrophe the revival of ISIS, the new crisis with refugees from the region, I see firstly, they need to increase the number of journalists, foreign human rights activists, foreign NGOs working here directly in the region on the ground. Secondly, there is a need to raise awareness of the real situation in the region. For this, we need independent journalists, independent researchers. Now, there are two categories of journalists and researchers in the region. Those who come for a short time and write very superficial texts about the region, and those who work with uh, the authorities of the autonomous administration, which also doesn't allow us to talk about the independence of their point of view. We need people who will work directly with the inhabitants of the region, integrate into society and understand better needs of the locals. There were problems that Rojava managed to solve only after these problems were written uh, about by the media and public attention was directed. For example, the participation of children in armed structures in Rojava. Children no longer participate in the fighting in Rojava but this was only achieved by drawing media attention to the recruitment of minors into armed structures. Other issues that require urgent resolution, and which in my opinion may also be closer to resolution if they receive sufficient media coverage, uh, it's honor killing. First, it's honor killing, forced marriages, the situation of LGBT people, uh, tabooing the topic of abortion. The autonomous administration is stricter in its fight against honor killings and child marriages. Attracting the attention of the media and the public to these problems will greatly simplify the work of the autonomous administration in the fight against these crimes. In addition, highlighting the issues of honor killings Child marriages will attract the attention of foreign NGOs and internationalist activists who can see the need to work here. After all, even the creation of shelters for women and girls, the work of psychologists, uh, all this requires financial investments and human resources. And all these problems can be solved if there is enough cover of these topics in media if we don't uh, turn a blind eye to existing problems. This also includes coverage of um, the struggle of LGBT people, the difficulties they face during the revolution. Um, great importance uh, is the work with the legalization and simplification of the abortion procedure, procedure. This topic is taboo. In many aspects regarding the legalization of abortion, there is no clarity. And this topic needs to be raised since the revolution in Rojava is called the women's revolution. The second problem that can be and should be covered in the media is the situation of refugees and eternally displaced persons. The world has forgotten that Afrin, Serikania and other cities were occupied. Uh, new wars have begun in the world. For example, now there is a war in Ukraine. And the whole world sympathizes with the Ukrainian refugees. And there are, but, but where are the guarantees that in few years they will not try to fence off Ukrainian refugees with a wall, as they did from refugees from Iraq and Syria in a couple of months ago? Why is the solidarity with refugees disappearing so quickly? The third problem that we can influence is the war and humanitarian catastrophe that exists in the region. We should talk about the occupation of Syria by Turkey and its proxies as often 
as we talk about the situation in Ukraine. If the world did not ignore the occupation of uh, Syrian territories by Turkey, perhaps the other imperial states would not have the desire to attack other countries. Any military aggression by any country against civilians should be condemned by the public. It's impossible to turn a blind eye to any military aggression because ignoring wars leads to new wars and we should take better care for each other. We live on the same planet. That's it, I think. Thank you so much, Lisa, for all of that. Thank you for listening to me. Of course. <laughs> so we will have time for question and answer at the end. I will go ahead and introduce our other speaker now. Of course, uh, if you have questions, please go ahead and put them in the chat and we can go ahead and start um, taking stack. Don't, don't let the questions that you have for Lisa uh, disappear. So I will go ahead and introduce our second panelist. Um, Polina Sadovskaya is a Eurasia program director at PEN America. PEN America works to ensure that people everywhere have the freedom to create literature, to convey information and ideas, to express their views, and to access views and ideas and literatures of others. At PEN America, Polina leads a program connecting American writers and artists with those from Ukraine, Russia, Belarus, Armenia, and Georgia and protecting freedoms that make it possible. Pre previously, she was with UNESCO, the United Nations Educational, Scientific, and Cultural Organization's Division of Freedom of Expression and Media Development. From 2014 to 2016, she worked for Habitat Pro Association in New York. She is active, she's an active supporter of women's and youth's rights around the world and is a member of IFEX Council, IFEX, formerly known as the International Freedom of Expression, uh, International Freedom of Expression Exchange, is a worldwide network of over 100 non-governmental organizations that advocates for the free expression and access uh, to information rights of all. She is a member of the Coalition for Sustainable Development of Russia. Polina is currently based in BBC, Georgia. Polina, thank you so much for joining us today. The floor is yours. You are muted. Yes, uh, apologies for that. Um, thank you, Bettina, so much, and good evening, everybody. Also, uh, uh, thank you, Lisa, for sharing um, sharing your story and just uh, once again reminding us uh, how important uh, is uh, uh, to have independent journalism and and to support independent journalism all over the world. Um, thank you for inviting me to this event. It's a pleasure to speak to you all today, and I believe our conversation is very uh, important, very timely. As Bettina mentioned, I work in the region which we used to call Eurasia in the United States, which I personally don't really like because of the imperial nature of it. Eurasia, Eurasian Forum, Eurasian people, the one people is uh, the narrative often used by leaders such as um, uh, President Vladimir Putin to conduct horrendous atrocities against citizens of neighboring countries. So this concept of Eurasia, I believe, should be reconsidered. I like to say that I work with writers, artists, journalists, truth tellers in countries like Ukraine, Russia, Belarus. Uh, writers uh, are, I believe, the ones who will eventually find the right word, find the language for all of us to speak about um, what's happening in the region. So what is happening in the region? All eyes are on Ukraine, of course, right now. Um, since we touched the issue of terminology, forgive me, but I'll make a little side remark, uh, which I think is crucial um, before we even start talking about uh, international solidarity. 
So on March 4th, Russia adopted the law on criminal penalties and fines uh, for fake news about the Russian armed forces, as well as for calls for sanctions against the country. This law basically means that dissemination of news that is not uh, based on the information from official sources can lead to up to 15 years imprisonment. Of course, this is the end of independent journalism as a whole. But what particularly important for us today is that the official sources do not call the war in Ukraine a war, but a special military operation and require everyone to do the same. The words we use to talk about what's happening in Ukraine could unintentionally overlook the Russian invasion. War, invasion, signifies that you are unilaterally breaking the sovereignty of another nation. It should be clear that if the nation forces its people to avoid such words, it wants to hide the fact of invasion. And it is also sad to see the news that the United Nations um, as well is supporting Russian disinformation campaign by instructing staff not to refer to the situation in Ukraine as a war or invasion. When describing a tragedy that has already killed hundreds of civilians and uh, thousands actually, and forced uh, more than uh, 3 million people to flee the country. Another important word, uh, the meaning of which was distorted by Russian government and propaganda is genocide. Blaming Ukraine in genocide of Russian people in the Eastern Ukraine, Russia justified the invasion by explaining it this way to its own people and to the international community. Two days ago on Wednesday, the International Court of Justice ruled on an urgent request by Ukraine for, for uh, Russia to halt its invasion, accepting the Ukraine argument that there is no evidence of Ukraine committing or planning attacks that could be deemed crimes against humanity. Moreover, the Genocide Convention, which both countries have signed, does not allow an invasion to prevent a genocide. In order to develop stronger cooperative global relationships, which the United Nations should lead, we should first of all get on the same page with these crucial definitions. Speaking of genocide, not only thousands of Ukrainians are killed on their territory right, in less than uh, a month right now, it seems that Russians deliberately target cultural heritage of Ukraine, possibly trying to eliminate the nation as a whole. The Russian leader is known for saying that he doesn't think Ukraine is even a country, a nation. Just to give you a few examples, according to the Ukrainian Ministry of Culture, Russia has partially destroyed an architectural monument, the building of the Museum of Ukrainian Antiques in Chernigov, damaged Vasilivka Historical and Ar Ar Architectural Museum Reserve Popov Main Manor House. Svetohirsk uh, Lavra was damaged by Russian shelling. Russia shelled the building of National University of Kharkiv, built in 1925, and bombing of the drama theater in Mariupol, where about a thousand Ukrainians were hiding in a shelter, is simply incomprehensible. I would like to take this opportunity also to recognize the brave women who in the circumstances of war find it important to protect Ukrainian cultural heritage that is under brutal attack as the whole nation is. I talk about Alona Karavai, a co-founder of an art collective known as, um, known as um, Azertimenta Kimnata, assorted room, forgive me if I didn't pronounce it correctly, based uh, in the ivano frankivs Contemporary Art Center in Western Ukraine, uh, which has been scrabbling to evacuate and preserve works from grassroots art spaces. I also talk about the prominent Ukrainian historian Natalia Yekavienko, who remains in Kyiv despite continuous bombings and shelling. Currently, she's busy with translating Titus Livius, to Ukrainian. Almost 29 books out of 45 have been translated so far.
I also talk about my colleague Tatiana Terin, Vice President of PEN Ukraine, and many female writers who refuse any of our attempts to evacuate them from the war-torn Ukraine. Instead, all the writers turned fighters or humanitarian workers, searching for medical kits and protective vests for the civilian population equally attacked by, by Russian armed forces. I talk about Irina Tsilik, Ukrainian filmmaker and writer who won the prestigious award at the 2020 Sundance Film Festival for the movie The Earth is Blue is an Orange, about another brave woman, a single mother and her four children who live in the frontline war zone of Donbass. Irina's husband, writer Artem Chekh, fought in the Ukrainian army when Russians started this attacks, their attacks on Ukraine eight years ago, and now the war separated him from his wife and little son again. Speaking of cooperative if efforts that we all as a global human family have a responsibility to make in this situation, I'd echo a number of Ukrainian NGOs who have recently addressed various UN mechanisms, Council of Europe's committees and OECE, and also we'll add a few more examples later. So these actions, are, this um, uh, address is uh, a contained of four major points. First, uh, what is necessary is to take actions to protect Ukrainian civilians who are at additional risk in connection with their public volunteer civil ac activities, work in local self-government bodies or governmental agencies. Second, force the Russian Federation to comply with the provisions of convention uh, relative to the protection of civilian persons in time of war. Additional protocol to the Geneva Conventions, Hague Conventions, respecting the laws and customs of war on land and its annex and to end human rights violations. Third, call on the Russian Federation to immediately release all illegally detained persons in the territories of Ukraine, temporarily occupied by the Russian army, including activists, journalists, and representative of local self-government bodies. Disseminate information about the abduction, intimidation, and forced detention of civilians by the Russian army, including activists, journalists, and representatives of local self-government bodies of Ukraine. On top of that, I think we should give voice to Ukrainians uh, wherever we can and work towards protection of Ukrainian identity and cultural heritage. There are currently 24 free writers that are in Kiev, some in Odessa, some in Kharkiv, some still in Melitopol. Reading, publishing, disseminating the words of this uh, of these writers right now is essential. At Pan America, we do this work and we are uh, looking for more partners to be able to do more. At the same time, we should confront growing Russophobia, which can only lead to further hate and deepening of this crisis. Even more than just Russophobia, the international community should confront cultural boycotts. It is one thing to cancel the return of Valery Gergiev at La Scala. Gergiev is a long-time supporter of Putin. But canceling classes of Dostoevsky in the US University of Milan, like the professor Paolo Nori said, even dead Russians became a target right now. The desire to stigmatize all things Russian is an un understandable reaction to what is happening, but boycotting Russian music, theater, and art means compounding the authoritarianism and dehumanization, not protesting it. I probably should stop here, but happy to answer any questions. Thank you so much once again for having me. Thank you so much, Polina. Um, there is a question in the chat specifically to the list that you read out. Uh, does anyone know if this list is written anywhere to refer to by chance of needed global response? Um, is this a question about uh, the, uh, um, the recommendations that I just read from the NGO list? Uh, can the person who asked the, yes. Yes, yes, sure. I'm I'm happy to share it. Um, just give me a little minute and I'll try to find it and share it in the chat. Great, thank you. 
um, so as the questions are coming in and thoughts are coming in, I, I wanted to, yeah, I, I felt like both of the talks were, were very important. Um, and I, I am moved and I find it interesting that both of our speakers are coming from um, a personal experience of being Ukrainian and Russian and with the, the dynamic of what's going on in those places right now. Uh, and also thinking specifically about Lisa's talk um, regarding the choices that she's made as an independent journalist to, to cover a similar crisis uh, that has been ongoing in a region that's not her home region. And that put into my mind this question that I think is in the mind of a lot of people, right? Um, which is why do we uh, support and celebrate armed resistance and, uh, you know, like the right to self-defense of certain people in certain conflicts and not in others, right? Um, specifically thinking about the ways in which, and rightfully so, the Ukrainian people are being um, uplifted in their armed struggle against the Russian invasion, um, whereas that's not so much the case uh, in Kurdistan or necessarily the um, a view around the, the armed Kurdish resistance, and especially not in other instances of resistance, like for example, with Palestine um, or with indigenous resistance throughout the world. That's something that I think is interesting and worth talking about um, and hearing from our panelists. And uh, also both panelists talk about the importance of independent journalism and that put into my mind this question of um, how there are people who are experiencing conflict in certain regions whom we trust to tell their own stories. And there are people in other regions experiencing conflicts whom we do not trust to tell their own stories. Again, this similar dynamic, right, of, um, of, of uplifting as we should independent journalists in Ukraine and journalists that are that are right now covering this war and not uh, and not focusing our attention equally to independent journalism happening in places like Kurdistan and with the ongoing um, crisis in Syria that has been going on for over ten years, along with situations like Palestine and other indigenous resistances. Right. So this is this is just like some thoughts that are ruminating for me, and I don't know if if Paulina or Lisa want to offer some thoughts in regards to that, um, or other other of, of the people who are, are gathered here today for this chat. Sure, um, I can start. Olisa, do you do you prefer to start? <laughs> um, um, I'm. Uh, I forgot. Was it the first or the second question? But uh, I'll I'll just um, share what comes to mind. Uh, overall, um, I think uh, you're absolutely right. I mean, why? why we are talking so much about uh uh ukraine right now and and not uh talking not talking uh not paying enough attention to to the places to many other places that are struggling with uh sometimes similar situations um i um should just say from from my personal and professional experience i i was fully involved just two years ago uh in, in the situation in um uh belarus um after the uh, um uh, uh, uh rigged um after completely brown um results of the presidential elections uh, there was this massive uh movement of belarusian people um uh protesting uh, the results of this uh, presidential elections and um uh, this uh, movement was followed by the brutal uh, re uh brutal um violence uh from the from police and and the government um and we talked about and the at the um, in 2000 um uh, to 20 uh my colleagues uh belarusian pan um uh documented uh 
600 violations of cultural uh, rights and, and human rights violations of cultural figures. Um, and that was 2020, right? Uh, just already in 2021, the international media and uh, international community started talking less and less about uh, what's happening in Belarus. Now, no one is really talking about what's happening in Belarus. And I tell you more, Belarusians now are considered as someone who helped Putin in uh, what he is doing in Ukraine. And the uh, uh, um, ordinary Belarusians who actually still fleeing Belarus after what happened with them, uh, happens in their own country um, uh, with their own conflict, they are uh, don't ha they are denied grants, they don't have support and even have this you know uh, uh, attitude towards them as supporters of the uh, of the uh, of the Putin's regime. So it's it's all very complicated issues, and I'm, I I wish I I have an answer um, uh, to this. And I, I just can say that I totally agree that we uh, have to be have to have a, a little longer memory, probably, and um, um, keep see like uh, stop seeing uh, these conflicts conflicts separately, but try to an analyze how much they linked, because, you know, what is what is uh, uh, happening right now in Ukraine is uh, the consequence of the 20 years of Putin's rule when he was allowed to do what he was doing, including in, in Syria, including in so many other places. So that's just my um, reminder to everyone to 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 everyone to just be a little bit um, more attentive to uh, to what was happening in the past and how it is linked to what we are having right now. I just jumped on stack. Um, thank you, Polina and Lisa. Um, I'm Kira. I work with Bettina and um, Manuel at Habitat Pro, and I just wanted to. Um, especially in the context of this uh, event being a part, being a kind of parallel event um, on the fringes of the Commission on the Status of Women. I want to um, highlight what um, the point that Lisa made about um, refugee camps and camps for internally displaced persons set up by the autonomous ad administration in Rojava being not recognized by the UN. And I want to highlight um, Polina's point that the UN has been instructing um, member state delegations to not use language of war or invasion. So I think, um, especially for, for our NGO, because the, our primary focus of work as well is indigenous people's rights and policy. So we come into this space knowing that there are limits and knowing that there's, um, you know, that the, these kind of rights frameworks give, give us a, a ground to stand on, but the idea is that it is by no means a ceiling. So we kind of have to strategize what work can be done within the UN space and what is the you know work that happens outside of it. And um, I just think that that's um, an important, um, kind of an, an important um, um, perspective to have as we enter into any kind of UN fora, because I think um, a lot of times the UN is kind of um, seen as being supranational, it's kind of like being an overseeing body, when in reality there's nothing, you know, there really isn't an authority that exists above the nation state, and that's part of the violence that we are struggling against um, in these kind of, um, in our, um, kind of when we come together in, in internationalist solidarity. And with that being said, also internationalism historically has always been um, it's always been um, the work of the proletariat, right? The work of the working class. It has been cooperation amongst the dominated, cooperation amongst the exploited. We're not talking about inter international relations. We're not talking about state actors making policy decisions and coming to um, mutually beneficial agreements. Internationalism is the people on the ground. And I want to also highlight Polina's caution of this Russophobia you know, that I, I think that a lot of us, I'm sure, have seen um, the this kind of homogenized targeting of the Russian people when there are, of course, Russian people on the ground who are resisting. 
this war and have been crit critics of Putin and are being persecuted and, and violated and um, put into jail and imprisoned for speaking out against that administration. So um, I just wanted to add that perspective as well. And I thank um, both of you and to Bettina for all of the um, insight that you've shared with us. Lisa, did you want to add something? Yeah, I wanted to thank you uh, both for, for your like the for points that you made. Uh, and I wanted to uh, add some about what Polina was talking about. Um, especially uh, about the Russophobia. I think this is the this is the consequences of of the politics of many countries, of the policy of many countries. And I think that it's very much important to raise awareness about the citizens of the countries that are considered as aggressors. For example, uh, let's make a parallel with uh, Russia and Russian citizens now in Russia who are under sanctions. Uh, this is basically a humanitarian crisis that will be soon in Russia. Uh, and it takes place already now, you know, because uh, um, because of the whole economical sanctions, because of the, uh, the people who are fleeing from Russia now. And um, basically, many Russian citizens, most of the Russian citizens, they can't get out of Russia. And uh, I want to make here a parallel with uh, Syria, because um, when Caesar Act was um, applied, I don't know how you say it in English, like applied on the Syria and Syrian regime. Uh, after that, mostly uh, like poor people suffered the most and women suffered the most. Uh, so this Caesar Act that's supposed to um, affect Syrian regime for the torture of people of its own citizens actually made it worse for those who suffer from the Syrian regime the most. And this is what I want uh, to emphasize that we have to raise awareness about the people who live in these countries like Russia and Syria and also Turkey, you know, because Turkey, who is occupying other countries and its citizens are not the same. You know, Russians are not Russia uh, and Syria are not Syrians, you know. So, yeah, it's very much important to help also those people to get out from these countries and to help them. I think it's another point that you made uh, that, that that resonates as well at this moment is I I'm, I apologize because I'm going to misquote you, but I'm just working from memory here. Uh, but it was something along the lines of the necessity to respond to uh, the you know military threat and military action against civilian populations on all fronts as a way to protect it from happening in the future right and so when we we saw you know putin and the the russian attack specifically in syria right happened years prior to what's happening in ukraine and as polina pointed out the things that happened in belarus and how this you know this is um to me, it feels like it's like a, a process that is rolling forward, right? And that we allow it to gain ground without this resistance. And I'm just, this is the, I feel like this is the great work of international solidarity that it can be fought on so many different fronts, right? Thinking specifically of the work of Bel that Belina is doing, the people that she's working with and the people that she mentioned in, in regards to the, the, the incredible power that cultural preservation has in resisting these forms of oppression, right? And thinking also of the Kurdish resistance and the, the one of the main, um, 
struggles on this front is is protecting uh, Kurdish culture and, and Kurdish language and having you know the these forms of expression exist without this um, like this resistance to colonization. That's exactly what it is, right? It's it's this constant struggle against. Um, homogenizing cultures, right? Also Polina's resistance to to the title of Eurasia, right? This notion of like a whole as opposed to a multiplicity. And um, yeah, I mean, I'm just, I'm, I'm just thinking about these things and how they're very interconnected, these struggles for autonomy uh, and these struggles for cultural uh, expression and preservation are worldwide, right? And they speak perhaps to this, um, this like unending drive that we have for international solidarity that ultimately we end up seeing ourselves in each other. Right? Do any of our, um, I don't know what the word in English is, but the people who are here with us <laughs> have uh, any questions for our panelists or any interjections and thoughts? I'm also uh, happy to engage even after uh, this talk. So I'll just put my contact here if uh, whoever wants to reach out later. Um, and I think we covered a lot and I'm, you know, I appreciate um, Lisa and Polina, you know, the interventions that you shared. And I think, um, we definitely probably will want to compile if, if folks want to um, put their, your email addresses in the chat so that we can send um, the recording of this event. We will have it on our website, which I will type here. Um, and then I'll type my email in here as well. But we also um, host events, um, organize events like these at the Permanent Forum on Indigenous Issues which uh, is coming up at the end of April. So the last week of April and the first week of uh, May. So if you want to get on that um, email list as well, we can keep you informed of that. And we would love to have you and continue these conversations. Great, well, thank you so much to everyone for joining us today. Um, I'm gonna stick around for a minute, but otherwise it was lovely to be able to spend this time together with these issues. Thank you so much to all our great organizers. Thank you, Papina. Thank you all. Thank you, Lisa.